I just want to encourage you, like I did last week, that we're starting at the beginning in the laying the foundation for full life in Christ. And what that means is that some of the early lessons particularly are going to be uh, material that you probably are very familiar with. You've already traversed that area, territory. But uh, hang with us because as we get on three or four or five weeks into it, I think you're going to find pick up some new things that you didn't know before. And not only that, but it'll give you a fresh grasp so you can share with somebody else. So that's the way we're going to approach our session tonight. Last week we learned that there's a stage. History is like a stage. There are many players and actors upon that stage, but right at the very center, there is one key overwhelming personage, and that is Jesus. We know him as Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. In those days that he lived here on this earth, they knew him as Jesus of Nazareth. But he is the one that history surrounds. And coming to know him, the Holy Spirit's job is to shine a focus, a spotlight upon him, Jesus, so that everyone who... uh, becomes acquainted with him, will recognize and realize he is the Lord. He is the one that uh, they they have to deal with and will give their hearts and lives to him. Now, uh, the thing that's important for us to realize is that uh, we had a definition last week which uh, of a Christian which said, a Christian is one who has developed a personal commitment to this Jesus. But that involves loving him, Trusting him as Savior and obeying him as Lord. Now, in order to trust Christ as Savior, we have to make a decision to do that. Not just with our uh, intellect, not just with our emotions, but we have to make a decision with the will power that God has given us. And we have to decide, okay, I am going to follow Jesus Christ. So it's a, a, a commitment that we make from the very depth of our being that involves all of our being and we say to him I recognize that you are you came here to be the Savior you are the Savior and I just give myself to you so that you can function as Savior in my life that's what I want you to do and when this takes place then we trust him we've trusted him as our Savior somebody might say well uh, and, and, and until the will you know, brings us to that point, then perhaps we haven't really become a Christian. Some might say, well, you know, I grew up in the church and I had uh, some very emotional experiences. I can remember one time in camp when I was really, I mean, I would just wept and cried and don't you think I'm a Christian? Well, I'd say probably you are, but if your will has not been surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and you weren't from that day on a different person, then I don't know that you have. Some will say, well, I read my Bible and I pray. Surely I'm a Christian, and undoubtedly you are. But there are some people who read their Bible and pray just to try to please God or to try to appear righteous or holy in the eyes of other people. And so that isn't necessarily it unless our will has cooperated and we have come and yielded our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we look at this diagram once again and we realize that as long as we are sitting on the throne. As long as we still have determined that we are going to rule things, then we haven't really become a Christian. And it's like a marriage. Uh, The whole being has to be involved in making a commitment for marriage. I mean, you can find a young lady who you think is the most attractive and beautiful and wonderful young lady and stimulating intellectually to you and your mind says aha this is a great person I've got to get to know this person better and then as you do Cupid strings his bow and the arrow comes and playing right in your heart and now you begin to feel all kinds of emotions for this person and so that leads you to come to the point where it's time to get married but the emo- the intellect opens the door. The emotions bring you there, but the fact isn't accomplished until you stand before someone in authority and they say, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife? And you say, with your, the depth of your being, I will, and you make that commitment for the rest of your life. That's the way it is in coming to know Jesus Christ 
as our Savior. We have to make that commitment to him. We have to say, okay, for better or for worse, Jesus, here I am, and I'm giving myself to you. Now, let me just say this. Once we have come to the place where we've committed him to him, our life as our Savior, then we come to the third part of the definition, and that's where we're going to be tonight, and that is we make Jesus our Lord. Now, many people uh, misunderstand this whole idea of lordship because we live in a democracy, and we're not used to coming under somebody as a ruler. <laughs> and yet, what we're going to discover tonight is that actually the good news, the gospel is called good news in the Bible, the good news is about a kingdom. And if there's a kingdom, then there's a king, right? There's a ruler. Look in your notes and you'll see, uh, along with me, that this is the way it, it's described in the scriptures. Predicted by the prophets, uh, they look for a Messiah all through the years of the Old Testament history. They look for a king who is going to come. Notice that familiar verse in Isaiah chapter 9 that we hear at Christmas time all the time. And notice these words in that verse. This is on page 4 of your notes. I'm sure you probably have found the page. Okay? This modern day kingdom is what we're going to be describing here together. And here it is. It was predicted by the prophets. And so... It says, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And he will what? He will reign on the throne of David. So this is what the people of Jesus' day were looking for. They were anticipating the coming of a Messiah. The coming of a king, the coming of a ruler. And that's what the angels announced on the day Jesus was born. They said, for unto you is born in Bethlehem a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, Christ the Lord means the Messiah, the King, has now arrived. John the Baptist introduced Jesus, and he announced the kingdom is almost here. Repent and get your hearts ready. And then Jesus began to preach and minister, and what was his first message? His first message was, repent, for the kingdom is here. And Jesus said, now I have come amongst you to bring the kingdom. The book of Acts is bookmarked on both sides by teaching about the kingdom. Jesus taught about the kingdom. And all throughout the book of Acts, we see the uh, apostles teaching about the kingdom and instructing people that the kingdom was here. And then at the end of the book of Acts, the very 20, uh, chapter 28, verse 31, we have Paul in, under house arrest. But what was he doing? All the people that came to him, he was preaching to them about the kingdom. We may think that the most important thing that Jesus came here to do was to save our own particular soul. Well, he did want to do that, and he does that. But that's not the main purpose for which he came. The main purpose for which he came was to establish a kingdom. The kingdom of God here on this earth once again. And so it tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that... What happens really is that when we give ourselves to Jesus, he comes and he rescues us out of the kingdom of darkness and transfers us where? Into the kingdom of his son. See that passage there in, first, in Colossians chapter 1.13. And uh, here we have a depiction of, uh, of that. And... Uh, there are two kingdoms, and the kingdom of darkness is where we are sitting on the throne, as we've seen, and the theme of that kingdom is, my will be done. The kingdom of light is the kingdom where Jesus is on the throne, and we're nestled in his arms, <laughs> and the theme of that kingdom is, thy will be done. And so the Christian is one who has transferred kingdoms. It's not, the Christian isn't one who has found freedom to do whatever he wants to do, to be independent and uh, uh, live in a whole new context. But what the Christian has done is they've escaped out of the kingdom of Satan, which is bondage, and they've come into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of light, which is freedom. 
they've switched rulers. They still have a ruler, but now they have a benevolent ruler, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now look at the top of the next page, page 5, and see with me that Jesus is the rightful ruler of the kingdom, of this kingdom, because of several reasons. And you can write these in your notes. First of all, because he is the creator. It says that Christ himself is the creator who made everything in heaven and earth. John tells us he made the world. Nothing exists that was not made by him. So if he is the creator of it all, then yes, he has a right to be the Lord, the ruler. The second thing is, it says in the next verse in Colossians 1, 17, that he is the sustainer. He was before Ellis began, and it's by his power that he holds everything together. Did you ever stop to think why all the molecules and atoms that make up this universe pull together instead of flying apart? Do you ever stop to think of how structural, structurally beautiful it is in this whole universe, all the way from the farthest galaxies to the little tiny microbe? Everything works in symmetry. Everything is, is just as it's supposed to be with this much uh, energy exercised here, this much energy exercised there. How did that all happen? Is that by happenstance? No way. This is because the ruler of the universe, Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, the Bible says, holds it all together, holds it in its course by his power. I guess he has the right then to exercise rulership over that which he has created and that which he has sustained. But let me just share with you also, not only that, but write again in your notes, he is the final authority. And there's a marvelous passage in, Ro in Revelation chapter 1 where we see Jesus, not as he was here before his crucifixion and resurrection, but we see him as he is now, seated at the right hand of the Father. And all of a sudden, one day, the Apostle John was on the Isle of Patmos. He was exiled there, and he was worshiping, and all of a sudden, he heard this voice behind him. He turned around, and here's what he saw. I turned to see who was speaking, and there behind me were seven candlesticks of gold, and standing among them was one who looked like Jesus, who called himself the Son of Man, wearing a long robe circled with a golden band across his chest. His Hair was white as wool or snow, and his eyes penetrated like flames of fire. His feet gleamed like burnished bronze, and his voice thundered like the waves against the shore. He held seven stars in his right hand, a sharp double-bladed sword in his mouth, and his face shone like the power of the sun in unclouded brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and he said, Don't be afraid, though I am the first and the last, the living one who died, who is now alive forevermore, who has the keys of hell and death. Don't be afraid. And what an experience this would be for the Apostle John. You know what? If you and I had stood in his shoes and we had seen this glorious being, who is Jesus, the ruler, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords, and we had seen him, his face like bronze, his eyes flaming, flaming like fire, you know, his hair white like wool, his voice like the sound of uh, thundering uh, waterfalls and cr waves crashing on the shore. If we had seen him like that, you know what would have happened to us? Boom! We'd have gone down too. I mean, all our circuits would have disconnected. And we would have found ourselves on our face before him. Why? We couldn't help it. I mean, that's who he is. He's so awesome. He's so great. He's so powerful. He has a right to be the ruler. Can you say amen to that? Do you agree with that? He has the right to be the ruler of this kingdom. And so we're invited into this kingdom. Now, here is why the main message of the New Testament is this phrase that I want you to write big in your notes. Jesus is Lord. It was the earliest creed of the church. Jesus is Lord. This is what they greeted one another with when they saw each other. Jesus is Lord. Not just Jesus is Savior, but rather Jesus is Lord. Now you can continue writing there on that page. The Bible mentions Savior 37 different times. 
But, Lord, 7,736 times. Now, all of these mentions of the Lord isn't necessarily referring to Jesus himself. Some refer to the Father. But the whole concept in the Bible is that Savior, yes, but Lord, absolutely. Now, right next, will you please? Salvation without Lordship is only a half a gospel. Salvation without Lordship is only half a gospel. So many times people make decisions for Jesus or they make some kind of a commitment. And maybe they come to Jesus because they have a need and he can meet that need. But if things don't go just the way they would like to have them go, or if somebody crosses them or says something that they don't want them to say, then it all goes out the window. I had a, a gal who uh, I had the privilege of marrying a number of years ago, and um, her husband was uh, not at all interested in spiritual things. And then one day, literally, God showed up in the cab of his truck with a, as a great ball of light, scared him to death. And the next Sunday he was in church, and he was, went to the altar, and he gave his heart to Jesus, and for about six months he was very fervent, but then pretty soon we didn't see him anymore. And now his wife was in my office in tears. I don't know if he ever really gave his heart to Jesus. I don't know if he ever really became a Christian, and who would know? Because something was said he didn't like, and so he was off. He had a self-centered gospel. And that's what happens with the half gospel you'll see at the top of the next page. It is a self-centered religious experience. The church today is plagued with this. And many, often those of us who are theologians and pastors have brought this on ourselves because we haven't made clear from the very beginning the real gospel. We haven't made clear the full gospel. Half-saved believers go through life continually asking, what can Jesus do for me? Whereas the real question is, what can I do for Jesus? That's the real question. And so we have a situation in America where uh, the Barner Report was just uh, highlighting the fact that amongst church-going Christians of evangelical persuasion, the divorce rate is just as high and in some instances higher than amongst Total pagans, non people who don't go to church at all. I mean, that's unbelievable. How can that be? There's many people who have no concept of what Jesus saved them from and what he saved them for because all they're thinking about is themselves. Do they like what's going on? Is Jesus treating them the way they think he should be treated? If they don't like it, then they're going to get mad and they're going to go someplace else. That's a counterfeit gospel. And a lot of people have been called to trust, but they've not been called to obey. In your notes, there's an analysis about the difference between the authentic gospel and the half gospel. Let's look at that together. The authentic gospel is come to Jesus and give. Give your life to his control. Give yourself as a living sacrifice. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. It's putting Jesus on the throne. It's letting him exercise lordship in your life. The half gospel is this. Come to Jesus and get. Get healed. Get joy and peace. Get prosperity and excitement. Get blessing. Well now, Jesus wants to do all these things for us and he will do all these things for us but they are not the main course. This is what happens. This is the, the, the dessert that comes after the main course. This is, this, this is what happens to those who commit their life to him, and Jesus blesses them, and they do get these things. But the whole purpose of the kingdom is not so they might get these things. The authentic gospel says Jesus is Lord, I'm his servant. The half gospel, the counterfeit gospel says, I am Lord, Jesus is my servant. Now, I don't know anybody who would so blatantly come out and really say that, but by their actions, that's what you would gather 
They're looking for Jesus to pamper them, Jesus to take care of them, Jesus to make sure nothing bad happens to them, Jesus to help them get rich and, and wealthy, and all these things that they think Jesus should be doing for them. Sometimes they even try to find a verse in the scripture, and they put on that verse, and they say, you have to do this, God, because it says right here, you're my servant, you do this. How arrogant. I mean, not only arrogant, but, you know, sacrilegious. That isn't at all the gospel. The gospel is, Lord, you are so great and wonderful and you've died for me and you've given your life for me and I love you so much. How can I serve you? How can I bring forward your kingdom? What can I do that will make my life a pleasing in your sight and of glory and honor unto you? And so look at the middle of the page where it says, we are truly saved only by making Jesus our Lord. Now there's a, a critical verse in Romans 10. It says this, For if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, what will be the result? You will be saved. Okay, so how is it that we're saved? We're saved by confessing with our mouth that Jesus is our Lord and believing in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Now we learned together that in Isaiah 9, back in the Old Testament, the people there were looking for a savior and or were looking for a ruler, a king that would come. We have been taught and raised to look for a savior. Well, now both are right. Jesus is a savior, but he's a savior because he's a ruler and he rules us, he saves us by ruling us. Some people think salvation is a fire escape out of hell. Oh boy, I get saved so I won't have to go to hell. But it's far more than that in God's eyes. It's rescuing us from all the harm, the evil, the self-will, all the lingering vestiges of the kingdom of darkness that we have lived in all these years, all that's been frustrating God's plan in our life. It's saving us from all of that. And how does this happen? It only happens when Jesus comes on the throne. Look at this um, depiction which you have also in your notes. There's two different lifestyles here. This one is the lifestyle of the person who is still on the throne of their life. They're still making their own decisions. If they, isn't, they don't believe in Jesus. He's still around. But as far as who's running the show, they're running the show. And here's all the various activities of their life represented by these dots. There's no symmetry, kind of helter-skelter, isn't it? But look over here. Now the transfer has taken place. They have abdicated off the throne. Jesus has come on the throne. And look at the order there is in that life. Look at the, look at the peace and joy there is in that life. Look at the symmetry in that life. Now that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to save us from ourselves. From all the disorder, all the plagues, all the uh, uh, stress and strain and everything that we go through by running our own life. He wants to save us from that and bring us into his kingdom where, as it says in the Bible, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, that's a great place to be. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So as long as self is on the throne, that can't happen. But when Jesus comes on the throne, then as it says in Philippians 3, he can save us to be all that God intended for us to be. That's what he wants to do. That's what he intends to do. He's not a tyrant. He's not out to get us. He's not wanting just to make sure his will is done in our life. He wants to bless us. He wants to make us all that God impatterned envisioned when he created us in the first place. And if we confess with our mouth Jesus as our Lord, then we can be saved from ourself. Because he's now in a position to take care of the mess we've made out of our own life. And all that Satan's trying to do to ruin God's work in our life, he now is in a position to do something about that. Because we've given our life to him, we've made him Lord, we put him on the throne, we said, okay, I'll follow your directions, you rule and reign now. So look at the quote from Charles Colson at the very bottom of that page. Charles Colson 
at one time was in jail because uh, he uh, was one of uh, President Nixon's uh, hatchet men and uh, was doing some illegal things. But he found Jesus, and he's become really a prophet to our generation. And here's what Charles Colson says. Read it with me. If we really understand what being Christian means, that, is, that this Christ, the living God, actually comes in to rule one's life, then everything must change. Values, goals, priorities, desires, and habits. If Christ's lordship does not disrupt our own lordship, then the reality of our conversion must be questioned. Now that's an incredible sentence, that last sentence. Why don't you underline that in your notes? I think it's worthy of doing that. If Christ's lordship does not disrupt our own lordship, then the reality of our conversion must be questioned. So a Christian is one who obeys Jesus as Lord. Now we're ready to come on the top of the next page to a definition of the kingdom. And so let's look to see that here's what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God consists of all those, whether this side of death or the other, who are registered under the God's government because they made Jesus Christ their Lord. That's what the kingdom of God is. Now I'm going to teach you a Greek word here in a moment. When Jesus spoke Lord, he was, uh, and it was written down in the New Testament, it was, the word was Kurios. You can write it in the blank there. Kurios. And Kurios is what is translated in English as Lord. So when it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you're saying if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Kurios, that's what it was in the original language in which he spoke. And here's what that means. Absolute ruler, supreme controller. The whole idea of curios, of giving over absolute authority to somebody else, letting somebody be an absolute ruler and controller in our life is very, very difficult for people who have been raised in the USA of America. Ruth Ann and I have been reading some historical novels recently about the early period in our life, and I want to tell you, it, you can be proud of our forebearers. I mean, they were independent. They were resourceful. <laughs> they didn't take guff from anybody. I mean to tell you, they just, you know, they, they lived life with gusto. But for most of them, it was them living life. It was their independent way that they went. The whole pioneer spirit is in the warp and woof of our society. People don't like to be told what to do. They want to be independent. And I want to tell you, that's a huge handicap to coming into the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are people who are raised, some of you sitting here may have had this experience. You were raised in a home where you were never, never forced to do anything that you didn't want to do. People have been raised since a little child. And they've been able to, because of their tantrums or their cuteness or they bamboozled uh, their parents, uh, their teachers, their everybody, until they just absolutely, I mean, they don't know what it's like to give their will over to somebody else. They don't know what it's like to say, all right, I may not like to do that, but if you say I should do that, I will. And they have a horrible time. I mean, it's terrible trying to adjust to life in the kingdom. And they struggle and struggle. It's sad. A lot of people don't make it because they just don't, haven't been trained that way. They, they, it, it's contrary to their upbringing. Jesus can change all that if we give him the opportunity. But he is Lord. And so therefore, that brings us to this understanding that if we say with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, that's not just a pious platitude. It really implies as it says in your notes, unbending allegiance to his supreme authority, it signals we've come to an end of life on our own terms. Now I want you to know that what I'm going to share with you next is not what Joe Atkinson is saying, but this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9. Jesus 
set forth the qualities, the characteristics of the kingdom. And those who could come into the kingdom. And what was expected of them as they came into the kingdom. And there are three characteristics. The first one is this. You can write it in your notes. It's self-denial. Anyone who wants to follow me must put aside his own desires and conveniences and carry his cross with him every day and keep close to me. You know what the modern church has done with this verse? They've created a little ritual that people might go through at Lent. It's called self-denial. Maybe you stop smoking during Lent. Or maybe you give up candy during Lent. Or maybe you have some other thing that you do. Deny yourself during Lent. Now, I'm not saying that those aren't good things to do, but what I'm saying is that's such a far cry from what Jesus is talking about. It's unbelievable. Jesus isn't talking about just denying yourself some little thing. Jesus is talking about taking up your cross. You know what the cross was? <laughs> the cross was not something that you put on the top of your steeple if, it, when you're building a church, nor is the cross something you wear around your neck. The cross, as far as, I mean, people would have been shocked. They would have been scandalized to see somebody wearing jewelry made out of a cross in Jesus' day. Because the cross was a curse. The cross was the cruelest instrument of death that they knew. And so, what happens is this, that we think we give up something or we think self-denial is, is doing this at land and so forth. And what happens is that we get inoculated with this little thing that keeps us from coming down with the real thing. That's what inoculations do. God help us. What Jesus was talking about was not just only denying yourself, but dying to yourself. He doesn't want to just uh, dethrone our pride. He wants to kill our pride. And you know, when we, are, when we die to ourselves, then... We don't have any plans for ourselves anymore. Dead men are only looking one direction. And they don't have any plans anymore for themselves. <laughs> Jesus said, come and take up your cross and die with me. If you want to be my disciple, then that's what I am asking you to do. If we don't die to ourselves, then we try to follow Jesus, and it's like we're on a yo-yo. One minute, you know, we're in victory, and, and we're doing what Jesus wants to do. The next minute, we're doing what we want to do. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Jesus and me. You see, it's absolutely impossible to say Jesus is Lord and then say no to him. I mean, how can you stand before the King of Kings and say, oh, you're my Lord? No, I'm not going to do that. No, I don't want to do that. If he's your Lord, you don't say no. If he's not your Lord, you can say no. If he's your Lord, you say yes. Oh, it may be hard, Lord, but you help me. You'll have to help me. But yes, I will do what you want me to do. I will forgive those people that it's impossible for me to forgive. I will treat other people with dignity. I will follow your word and do the things that your word requires. I will do that. Now, the second thing you can write next is, not only did Jesus say, those who want to be my disciples, here are the terms. Self-denial, but the next is total commitment. Total commitment. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find, save it, but whoever insists on keeping his life will lose it, Jesus said. You know, I think that's one of the most amazing 
full of depth statements that Jesus ever made. In the years when I used to be marrying a lot of people because uh, I was full-time as a pastor, when we counseled together with them, I always would say that there is a secret of happiness in marriage. And we talk about this. And it boils down to the fact that here's the secret. He wants to be happily married, must not seek for his own happiness, but the happiness and well-being of the person that he loves or she loves. Marriage break, breakdown and lack of happiness and joy and fulfillment in marriage comes to the degree that we break that law. We begin to put ourselves first, our own wishes, our own desires, our own feelings, our own hurts, and we begin to put those things first, then marriage begins to disintegrate. But I used to tell the couples that if you give happiness it's like you throw out a boomerang and you know what happens when you throw a boomerang? Comes back and lands in your own hand, right? Comes back to you. You give happiness away and it comes back to you. You grab it for yourself and you lose it. You lose it. So Jesus is saying, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it for my sake. If you hold on to your life, then you will lose it. And <clears throat> this was evident in what Jesus did in dealing with that young rich ru ruler in the um, 18th chapter of Luke. Here came, came this young man. He was a very upstanding young man. He was rich. He was young. He was attractive. He had much going for him. And he was sincere about wanting to know about the kingdom. And he said, Lord, how do I get in the kingdom? And Jesus said to him, obey all the commandments. And he said, I have for my youth up. Well, we learned last week, none of us have obeyed all the commandments, not even the first one, every day, 24 hours a day from our youth up. No, but Jesus didn't argue with him. The man was sincere. He had tried and said, that, but Jesus knew his heart. And he said, one thing you lack. One thing you lack. He said, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And what happened? The man said, oh, Lord, that's a great thing to do. No, no. It says he went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. Now, here's the thing. If you think about that, I've thought about that a lot. You know, and as a pastor, I would, to have a man come like that, a young man, rich, uh, full of uh, all kinds of, natural gifts and talents, you'd think, oh man, you'd covet him for the church, right? Be so good to have a man like that in the church. And so, even though you might have the courage to lay out what Jesus said, when you saw him walk away sorrowful, you'd be tempted to go run after him and say, well, wait a minute, let's, now, let's discuss this a little bit. Maybe, how about half? How about you sell half? Jesus didn't do that. He let him go because he knew what? He knew, and we'll find this out later on, that material possessions and riches would be his greatest competitor in the hearts of people. And so he said, this is what you really need to do. You need to make a total commitment to me. Now, making a total commitment to Jesus is not easy. <clears throat> I remember receiving a letter from uh, a ministry that works with troubled youth in Detroit area and... Uh, they had a, a, like a camp for this youth and, and uh, they would be assigned there often by the courts. And this one girl came and, and she'd had a very rough past and, and she found Jesus and was worked with by the counselors and went back determined to live for the Lord. But soon she got a new boyfriend back in Detroit. And her boyfriend one day asked her if he, she wanted to go to the other side of Detroit because he had an errand and would she come along and so she did, and uh, he went to this crack house to buy some cocaine and didn't have any money. And there were four drug dealers there, and so he bartered this girl for the cocaine. And so for 24 hours, she was abused. And one of her counselors later was talking with her because they hadn't seen her for a while, and it was almost like she thought, well, this is the way I show my love to him. This is what I should be doing. But then later on she admitted that she felt horrible and dirty the next day and, 
and, and uh, this wasn't the thing she was supposed to do. And this counselor was thinking to herself, what happened to this commitment that she made? And they began to realize that one of the reasons <clears throat> people don't persevere in their Christian life is because they have other commitments along with the commitment they made to Jesus. And sometimes these other commitments become stronger. Commitments to unsaved people whom they love. Commitments to <clears throat> building a fortune for themselves. Other commitments that soon interfere with the basic commitment to Jesus. Jesus said, it's total commitment. That's what I'm looking for, total commitments. <clears throat> you know, there was a communist by the name of Douglas Hyde who wrote a book, Dedication and Leadership. And, and, and in that, he said, in this book, he said, if you make little demands on people, you'll get little response. And that's all you deserve. But if you make big demands on people, you'll get a heroic response. Communists make far greater demands on their people than the average Christian organization would ever dare make. Communists never make small demands if they can make big ones. They have discovered by experience it's a good policy to ask a lot. It's a bad principle to ask for a little. And so Jesus says, as it, we say in the, note, in the notes there, anything that competes must go. It may be a part-time job, a friendship, a habit, a lifestyle, anything else of our own desire that interferes with our total commitment. The third term that Jesus sets forth, you can write in your notes, is public declaration. When I, the man of glory, come in glory, and the glory of my Father and the holy angels, I'll be ashamed then of all who are ashamed of me in my words now, and I'll confess those who confess me, it says in the next verse. Publicly acknowledging. I don't care who knows. I want everybody to know I'm following Jesus. About the person who has become a disciple of Jesus, who has entered the kingdom, there should be something different about them. Something that looks so good because they're under the loving lordship of Jesus that other people say, wow, I'd like to find out about that. And you know, if Jesus were here and he were giving invitations in our meetings like we often do in, in church, I, I've been guilty of this myself in the past sometimes where I would say, okay, everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. Now nobody looking around. If anybody wants prayer to give their, Jesus, their heart to Jesus, slip up your hand and God will see it and I'll pray for you. I don't think Jesus would do that at all. I think Jesus would say, okay, every head up, everybody looking around. Now, if anybody wants to come and follow me, stand up where we can see you. I think that's what he'd do. He doesn't want hidden Christians, secret Christians. He wants Christians who are willing to lay it on the line for him. Yes, I am going to deny myself. Yes, I'm going to make a total commitment. Yes, I'm going to publicly declare right here and now. Jesus wasn't after the masses, but he was rather after committed people who were willing to pay the price of making him Lord. That's what he was looking after. Now, the result of all this, and the next page is this. If we come to an end of life on our own terms, then we come under the authority of the king. And you'll notice that Jesus said, uh, Paul said in Romans 14, we are not our own bosses to live the way or die as we ourselves might choose. Living or dying, we follow the Lord. Either way, we're his. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose so that he can be our Lord, both while we live and when we die. So that's the principle and what happens is this, if we come under the authority of the kingdom, then we have a submissive spirit, which becomes our natural response. Write it down in your notes. First of all, to divine authority, we submit ourselves to God. Secondly, to spiritual authority, you know, God has instituted spiritual leaders that he wants us to submit to. He wants us to be under their authority and direction. And secular authority, submit your authority to every to every authority, it's to submit yourselves to every authority instituted among men. It's interesting that the authorities mostly were persecuting 
in the day that we're talking about. And yet Paul said this and so did uh, Peter. He said, you submit to their authority. You be good citizens. You follow their direction as far, in as far as you can. That's the response to the spiritual kinship of Jesus in our lives. And in the second instance, all our ways become submitted to the king. So that means we don't just go out and decide whether we should date this person or not. We submit that to the king. We don't go out and decide who we're going to marry. We submit that to the king. We don't decide what job we're going to take. We submit that to the king. We don't decide who we have as friends. We submit that to the king. We don't decide what our goals in life should be. We submit that to the king. We don't decide what we're going to do with our own money. We just submit that to the king. We don't even decide what we do with our leisure time. We submit that to the king. And when we're under his authority, then our constant prayer should be the one Jesus taught us to pray. Such a revolutionary prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, and so on and so on. And what's the first request? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Lord, as far as I am concerned and the people that I touch and the people around me, we are going to seek your kingdom first. Before anything we want to do. We're going to seek your kingdom first. And when that takes place, then life becomes altogether different. I want to tell you, what God is looking for is in this godless society that's stiff-arming the Lord, I don't need him, I don't believe he exists, I don't want to hear all that kind of stuff, I just want to make up my own mind. God intends to raise up in every locality a company of people who are going to corporately demonstrate a quality of life that can be only lived by coming under the lordship of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And when he does that, our world will be shaken like the world of his day was. Do you know that out of the thousands, maybe millions of people that heard Jesus and came to know Jesus or certain know about him, when it was all said and done at the very beginning, there were only 120 who initiated his kingdom? here on this earth, only 120. And yet he took this handful, he blessed them, he used them, he revolutionized their lives he, he, and the environment in which they live because they had made him their Lord. And he changed the face of history with this small group of people. And within one generation, the whole world, known world of that day, had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what he's calling you and me to do. He's calling us to be willing to submit to him as Lord. It'll take everything we've got, but it'll be the best investment we've ever made because Jesus will save us from the person we are, the person Satan wants us to be, the habits that we struggle with, the purposeless of our, our life. He'll save us from all that and he'll put such joy and such zest in our life living for him, he'll give us such a meaningful life experience that we wonder why in the world we didn't make that decision a long time ago. Amen? Okay, let's just pray. Father, we just thank you that you have come in the person of your son Jesus to rescue us out of the kingdom of Satan and transfer us into the kingdom of your son, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of joy, the kingdom of peace, the kingdom of holiness, the kingdom that one day will rule this whole universe. Lord, what a privilege. And Lord, we're sitting here in this room and we really do want to be followers of Jesus. <clears throat> we want to be Christians. We do love him. We are trusting him as Savior. And, and Lord, tonight we reaffirm to you that we are willing for him to be our Lord. It may cost us a lot more than what we even consider right now, but, but we know that's what is the right thing to do, and that's what you want. And so we make him our Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Rule and reign on the throne of our lives. In your precious name we pray. Amen.